Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I missed uh, just saying something about the offering, so I'll say it now. Um, uh, I, I, I felt I heard God speak to me some years ago, and, and this is literally what he said, you will need at least three millionaires to fully accomplish the vision that I've put in your heart. Now, um, at the time, actually, we were doing really okay because we had a lot of our community had been raised in church and knew all about this strange thing called tithing and felt committed to do that, uh, some for the right reasons and some for, some for fear and intimidation that God would punish them severely. Um, our demographic has changed a lot. Therefore, um, how we finance what we do has changed. And so I believe that was a real word from God. Um, so all it needs is, as with any ministry, it needs people who will step into the breach and say, and say, here am I, send me. This is my call, God, and I believe it. And there is a gift of giving that uh, the Bible talks about that is as important to the body of Christ as the gifts of preaching and serving and administration and music. And, uh, and so I encourage you because that's, 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 part of our, that's part of our future that is, is already set that, that will happen. It will happen. And I guess if I were to say, so who wants to volunteer for that? We'd get lots of volunteers. But in the same way that some of you wouldn't engage yourself to do what is necessary to preach or to teach or to learn music, uh, you don't just become someone who is resourced to be a giver just because you think I'd like all that money. You do it because there's a heart in you. And, uh, and uh, then um, uh, as you seek first the kingdom of God, these things get added. So I'm, I am believing for that and receiving that and uh, thanking God and encouraging you. All right, so who's out or who's supposed to be out or have they all gone? Okay, let's just have a stand up just, uh, just before we start to talk for a, a few minutes. I'm de determined to limit myself to one message. I can so easily preach two messages in one. I'm limiting myself to one message and then uh, we'll have another shot at the other one when we're together again. But just let our hearts be open, Father, to hear a word from you, to bump into God tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Welcome to everybody joining us um, online, live. Uh, pray for Ruby, who Jenny's looking after tonight. Uh, bless you, Jenny. Hope you're doing okay there. And, um, and also across the world, different people, those of you who listen, we bless you. Those who listen to this on podcast later, we welcome you as part of uh, our house and hope what we have to say tonight will encourage you. Um, I call my message tonight partly because I have to remember because it has to go up on the website and it also has to have the newsletter written with the right title. I've called it, I've called it One Wedding and a Funeral. Okay, For those of you again who don't get out much, you'll have no idea what, what that is because there was a, a, um, a very successful British film called Four Weddings and a Funeral. Well, I've called this One Wedding and a Funeral because uh, it's about one wedding and the death of a system. So um, uh, I want to talk to you about, I've been talking quite a lot out of the, the Gospel of John over the, the coming month or so, uh, because I, I believe that the book of John in the Gospels is, is to the Gospel what Genesis is to creation. Um, it actually sets the model and the process for everything which is to come, and we just haven't time to talk about that, but just chapter one of of, of uh, the Gospel of John is fascinating because it starts the same way as Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning. And uh, it really begins to give you a revelation of how God works, but not just how God works, but how God works through Jesus, who is God incarnate, who is exactly what God looks like, and uh, was full of grace and full of truth from the beginning. Some people got it wrong because they think we had the Old Testament, then along comes Jesus, and grace comes then. But actually, it all started in grace. And uh, we are looking to bring our thinking and our systems back 
to grace as being the start, not something we encounter along the journey, but it is the journey. It's the whole journey. All is grace. So there's this um, second chapter of John, which I've had on my heart, wanted to talk to you about tonight, is, um, is a, the story of when Jesus turned the water into wine. So I just want to read um, these 11 verses for you and then, then talk about them for a little bit. In John chapter 2, on the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim and he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine and did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This is the first of his miraculous signs that Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee, and he thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. So, because of what I said about John, this, this story has much more significance than just getting um, a wedding party uh, out of shtuck, okay? Its significance is, is, is far beyond that. Uh, and also the story is not about changing wine into water, it's about changing water into wine. And sometimes when I look at what the church has become, I think it's had the reverse miracle. You know, it's taken the wine that people had and turned that to water and made it very ordinary and quite boring and quite insignificant, very grey and very average. Remember this story is about turning water to wine, about turning natural to supernatural about turning ordinary to extraordinary is what this story is all about. So what we read is important, uh, I think, for three reasons, okay? So what we read is important because, number one, it's the first miracle. It says that right at the end. It's the first miracle. So this miracle, because it's the first, is actually revealing the shape of things to come. That's why I said it's more than just a story. It's also important because it's the third day. It says on the third day he went to a wedding. So, so the signpost is already pointing at the resurrection because if you remember Jesus kept saying the Son of Man will be taken by sinful men crucified but on the third day he will rise again. So right from the very beginning in the very first miracle that Jesus ever did we had the third day principle. Resurrection was on his mind. Life from the dead was on his mind. Okay? Death not being the end was on his mind. Dead things coming back to life were on his mind, okay, right from the beginning. And it's also important because it's a wedding. So why is it important that this is a wedding? Because the significant thing about weddings is it's the place where covenant was made, okay? So the wedding was a place of covenant, making a covenant with another person that was meant to be, in, in human context, a lifelong covenant. Um, but of course, in the God context, it's an eternal covenant. The Bible talks about God making a new covenant with us that is an everlasting, eternal covenant. So a wedding was a place for God to say, covenant's important, resurrection's important, and the shape of things to come is important and I'm going to show you all of them in my first miracle just like I believe and we've talked about it in Genesis chapter 1 in the story of creation it's actually not about the scientific process of creation it's about something much bigger the whole process of life and the shape of things to come so when we got start to look through this story uh, it talks about Jesus being an invited guest and was there with his mother and his disciples. Now, you just think in the context of hindsight 
of the importance to that wedding of Jesus being an invited guest. The importance to that wedding of Jesus being an invited guest cannot be overestimated. Because he was there, what was necessary could be taken care of because he was an invited guest. So, right at the very beginning of this story, I cannot overestimate to you the importance of letting Jesus be an invited guest. Now, if I'm going to broaden that out to include everybody, he was not a family member, it would appear. It would not even appear that he was actually close to the bridegroom, or maybe even the bride, or even the, the master, the organizer of the feast. But what he was was an invited guest. I believe what we've been shown here is that if we will start the whole process of having a willingness for Jesus to be an invited guest, in the process of life, things will happen that would not have happened were we not bright enough to allow him to be an invited guest. So I think whether you're, a, whether you're a, a, an atheist, whether you are pantheistic, whether you are, wh wherever you are, having Jesus as an invited guest is a pretty good idea. So I would start tonight by saying, if you've not consciously done that, I would make it real clear that Jesus is welcome in this stuff, okay? Now that doesn't push you into a corner of anything. It doesn't force you to have to embrace anything at this point. It just says, will you come to this thing which for them was life? Will you come to this thing that for me is life? It's very non-threatening. Um, and uh, you know, if he, if he has nothing to offer, then he'll come and he'll go and nobody will be the end of the wiser. My, my experience tends to tell me that where Jesus is an invited guest, uh, he will not leave, first of all, and you will have an impact because of his presence. So, you know, Chris talked about all the ways that the Bible talks about how one is this Christian word saved, uh, and I thought that was very interesting, but what I would say is very important is the first step is let him be an invited guest at the process of your living, okay? So, so... So that can't be overestimated. Now, the fact that there was no plan in place for what was about to happen next should not be un underestimated. What I mean by that is this, that, uh, that the, the, the wedding ran out of wine. And uh, so his mother says to him, Jesus, um, they have no more wine. Okay? Um, and Jesus' reply is interesting because he basically said, so what? What's that got to do with me? Basically, I'm, I'm not the organizer of this, this thing. This is not my jurisdiction of authority. Um, I'm just an invited guest. But his heart was filled with compassion for the fact that they had no wine at this wedding. Now, I want you to get this. This is the first miracle of Jesus, okay? So it's not a situation, Jesus, there's been a terrorist attack and 40 people have been slaughtered. Will you help? Okay. Um, it's not, here is somebody with a terminal illness and no money to pay their hospital bills. Will you help? It's just a wedding. It's just the normal course of events that he is involved in. Now, is Jesus compassionate in the midst of terrorism? Yes. Is he compassionate in the midst of sickness? Yes, he is. But there's something about this first miracle that says that the majority of ways in which he works is in the ordinariness of yours and my life. The events, right, that take place. The situations we find ourselves in. In one sense, you could say, well, it might be a good thing that they've run out of wine. Because it sounds from the master of the feast that most of the objective was we drink the good wine and we all get, we all get, you know, slammed. And then, you know, so one could say that Jesus might have said this is a good thing. Um, you know, because control is everything. And um, what I'm wanting you to catch is, is why should he feel this was important? 
And yet he has a compassion for the whole process. He has a compassion for his mother's sense of involvement. He has a compassion for the bride and groom's situation. He has a compassion for the master of the feast. He just has a compassion to help. But what is interesting is he says that, that, that what is this to me? My time has not yet come. In other words, he's sending a clear message to say, if you're thinking that heaven pre-planned what should happen here, um, if you're thinking that my life is so ordered that God has said you'll do this, 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 and this, he starts by saying right from the offset, you are wrong, okay? Because compassion affects the purposes of God. Therefore, the purposes of God will always be focused towards you because they are driven by compassion, not by sense of empire and domination. Oh, I'm God and I will control things. It's actually driven by this powerful, massive sense of tenderness and, and compassion. So it, what he's really saying is this is not in the plan. However, let's make it in the plan. That's really it. It's not in the plan, but let's put it in the plan. We hadn't thought to do this, but let's think to do this. We have no reason to get involved but let's get involved. I, I like that idea of, of a God who, representing himself with us, looks at our lives, minuscule as they are, you know, as one person here, a little dot on the planet, uh, part of almost seven billion people. So think how insignificant in the context of the wider picture of humanity. The Roman Empire's going on. There's all sorts going on in China and the East and all. There's all this stuff going on in the world, but, but, but somehow the compassion of God focuses right in to the situation that he encounters in this wedding. And uh, in view of that, he formulated a plan in the moment. That can't be underestimated. Now, this is also fascinating. There was no prayer request. No prayer request. Oh, Father, oh, Father God, oh, Father, Father, Father. I find it interesting. I'm sorry, I'm a bit critical now. And, and uh, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you that I have the righteousness of Christ. Okay. Um, <laughs> sometimes, it, it's kind of okay, but not okay. But, but sometimes in our prayers, you know, we... We do the Father, Lord, Father, Lord, Lord, God, Father, God, Father, God, Lord, God. We talk in ways we would never talk to somebody who we think actually cares about us. I don't say, oh, Chris, oh, Chrissy, Chris, oh, Chris, oh, Chris, oh, my sweetheart wife, Chris, 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 oh, Chris, Chris, oh, Lord, Chris. Very often we don't even use a name because there is a familiarity that has an expectation. You know, we might use it once, Chris, will you help me? But most often it would just be, will you help me? So all I'm trying to say is that sometimes what we think is necessary and how we manifest that, actually rather than showing that we've understood the tender nature of God, shows us that actually we haven't really understood the tender nature of God. And I think, I think prayer's important, but, but, but um, well, I'm not going to talk. Uh, prayer's important. I'm grateful for our prayers. And uh, I do believe it helps us. However, there are some models like this you have to look at that nobody put in a prayer request for an answer to the need that they'd encountered at this wedding. There was just a simple statement of the obvious. They have no more wine, Right? Sometimes that's the best kind of prayer. Simple statement of the obvious, they have no more wine, and then faith in the true nature of the person of Jesus. Whatever he tells you, just do it. That's it. There's no prayer request, just a simple statement of the obvious, and faith in the true nature of the person of Jesus. Whatever he says to you, do it. I tell you that because I don't want you to get hung up on the fact that somehow you will not be met by a compassionate God unless you pray hard, pray long, pray the right words, be intense, you know, all that stuff. Almost like we have to convince him to be tender because actually he's pretty reluctant, but you know, if we could just convince him to get involved. I think sometimes it's our stress 
that, that puts a barrier in the way of him being involved because we don't just state the obvious and then say, so whatever he says, that's what we're going to do. So the process was not initiated by inward-looking prayer. It was actually initiated by outward-looking instruction. I've got something to say about that in the, co in the context of um, confession. Um, in fact, I will throw this in because it's important. Uh, those of you who know anything about the Bible, uh, you probably never realized this because I, I hadn't. Um, but in the whole of the Gospels, in the whole of the book of Acts, which is the story of the expanding um, body of believers, uh, and in all of Paul's letters who wrote a third of the New Testament, not one time are we told to confess our sins. I just let that sink in. Whole of the Gospels, all of the book of Acts, all of the letters of Paul, who call himself the Apostle of Grace, and Chris said that our terminology grace actually came from Paul. Not one time are we told to confess our sin. Now, now John, John has a little go at that, um, but it's not what you think it is. James, who, who Martin Luther the Reformer called the Apostle of Straw, he wasn't too keen on James, um, wasn't Martin Luther, he mentions it, but actually the New Testament is, is, is notoriously scant, lacking in instruction that we're to confess our sins. It is full of instructions that we confess something else. So if we, com so, so if we confess our sins is a different context, but when you come then into Paul's writing, if believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Every time we're told to confess, it is not a confession of our sin, it's a confession of the solution to our sin. So I'm going to throw this in. This is a free one. This I would have preached about that if I didn't, this, if I didn't preach about this, but I think it's important here. So if I was raised, if you are sick, when you are sick, because of what Jesus did for you at the cross, Confess your healing, not your sickness. Confess that you are healed and you are whole in Jesus' name. I was told if you're struggling with finances, don't confess how poor you are and how broken you are, but confess how provided for you are by his, because he was made poor, that he might make us rich. We confess in our poverty, while we're still poor, the provision of the Lord. We confess in our sickness, while we're still sick, the healing of the Lord. So then why would we come in the context of sin and confess our sin? You see, Paul's idea was you don't come and confess I am a sinner, you come and confess I have been gifted righteousness by the work of Christ towards me and I am righteous in him. I am righteous in him. I have been made righteous in him. So here's a little freebie for you. We have no problem if we're sick saying, I confess that Jesus is my healer. We have no problem if we pause saying, I confess Jesus is my provider. When you are sat in front of your computer watching the pornography that you've been addicted to for 15 years, you don't confess, oh, I'm a sinner, this is dreadful. You confess, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Now that's made you quiet, hasn't it? Because you have no problem when you're sick you have no problem when you're poor, but sin is the same thing. The sickness of sin is the same thing. I will guarantee you some of you are going to get free from things that have bound you for years if instead of going under the weight of condemnation and confessing, oh, what a sinner I am, you start confessing, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I have been gifted righteousness. I have the gift of righteousness in me right now. I am righteous before the sight of God. That's the same thing as confessing healing and confessing provision. And guess what happens? What you confess is what you begin to manifest. So if you keep confessing your sin, you'll keep manifesting your... If you keep saying, oh, I'm sick, I'm so sick, I'm so sick, I'm so ill, I'm so sick, guess what you're going to keep being? 
If you keep confessing your poverty, guess what you're going to keep being? If you keep saying, oh, I'm so poor, I never have anything, nobody ever helps me, nothing ever comes. So what's going to happen if you keep confessing that you're a sinner? You'll keep sinning. That shocked some of you. It's like you look as though I just took a 4B2 and slapped you around the head. It's like that. It's one of those things that you think that can't be right, can it? Well, most of the New Testament supports the fact that that is right. So I want you to do it. Okay, that's a freebie, that one. That's a freebie. So, I got onto that because the process was not initiated by looking, by inward looking prayer, but by outward looking instruction. A confident expectation that the last word had not yet been spoken. That's our definition of hope. A confident expectation the last word had not yet been spoken. So when Jesus' mother said to them, whatever he says to you, do it, she was speaking out a confident expectation that the last word has not yet been spoken, which is a constant principle throughout the whole of the Bible. Okay, then we come to the essence of the miracle. Okay, the props were six stone water jars. Each capable of holding 20 to 30 gallons. For you modern people, that's 91 to 136 litres. Um, so if there were six of them, that's 120 to 180 gallons, if they're all full, um, which is 545 to 820 litres for you modern people. So imagine that uh, we've got now the water jars can hold up to 180 gallons of liquid. They can hold 820 litres of liquid. And the Bible says they were the kind of jars that were used by the Jews for ceremonial washing or purification. They represent a whole lot of ritual and ceremony and requirement and practices to provide some kind of purification. And they're empty. But guess what? The wine vats are as well. So it hasn't done much good to change the nature of the wedding, has it? Hasn't done much to help the master of the feast, has it? Hasn't done much to bless the couple, has it? All the ritual, all the ceremony, all those gallons of ceremonial, uh, um, ceremonial stuff, the purification stuff, the, 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 the ritual... And, and, and that's one of the reasons why we, we feel we have good authority from the Bible to, to stand against ritual and stand against ceremony because this is the indicator here that that had been enacted but it had not provided what needed to be provided. It was all about trying to feel good yourself, working for yourself. So there'd been a, a big amount of this obviously but, 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 but the jars were empty but wine vats are too. So, so the question is, was when Jesus said, so fill them, right, fill them. So, so he's going to change everything that they were familiar with. Everybody knows these jars are the kind of jars for ritual and ceremony. Or in other words, when you come into church or when you think about God, we have ideas of the jars, what is the ritual and what is the ceremony that needs to happen for purification? We all have those images and those thoughts. If, even people who've not really turned their life over to serve this God of Jesus have thoughts about what is there, what exists in ritual and ceremony that would need to be done for purification if, if you are wanting to be purified. So Jesus is going to take that whole system and completely transform its purpose, the whole thing. So now no longer will they be em uh, 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 engaged in that old system of ritual and ceremony, but now they're going to have the water that's going to turn to wine. So I have a question, was the water transformed because the purpose of the vessel was transformed? Because now instead of it being for ceremonial washing, it's now to serve the feast. So, so was the water transformed because the purpose of the vessel was transformed? Or was the purpose of the vessel transformed because the water was transformed? So was it the miracle in the water that transformed the vessel? Or was it the change of use of the vessel that transformed the water? I don't care. 
I really don't care. All I care about is whichever way it worked, the water became wine. Whichever way it worked, the system that once was full of ritual and ceremony and confusion that could never make it clear actually was now bringing life. All I know is that everything changed that day. And I have learned to have a much more uncomplicated theology around salvation. All I know is that if you catch this, something changes in that day. Something does, okay? So this event did not just mark the redeeming of a moment in that wedding. It was, it was challenging a whole system. A whole way of understanding was being replaced from something one attempted to achieve by their own efforts to something gifted by an act of pure grace. It was changing. It was all changing. Their whole understanding was changing. Now, I want you to note in the story the deceptive nature of the existing system. Here's the deceptive nature. Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. If you live according to the world view that is common in society, you are subject to this trickery. How many things have you experienced that when it starts, it's fantastic, it's so exciting, it's so wonderful? You know, because we've not got past this barrier, that's where a lot of people can't hold down a relationship. The psychologists call it limerence. You bring out the best wine, then the problem is when you've had the best wine and you're drunk, we try and slip all the rubbish stuff in. And, and uh, you know, um, I, I will be 60 on the 28th of March, 28th the day after the Saturday night that we are 60, okay? Um, and um, I, I, I'm long enough in the tooth now to make a choice. And that choice is either to be in total despair about this thing called life because I've walked this thing through so often that the best wine comes out but then the best wine is not what you thought it was. And the opportunities and the relationships and the possibilities turn out to not be what you thought they were. And, and we finish up with an accumulation of wounds and disappointments and disillusionments that you can actually then find yourself towards the end of your life full of regret rather than full of joy. You can find yourself empty because you lived in the process of ritual and ceremony or you can find yourself full because you had an invited guest who said, fill all that stuff up that didn't work and let's change it into something else. Let's change the ordinary into the extraordinary. Let's bring miracle in here and let's show that the end can be better than the beginning. Let's show that we'll turn the system around, that instead of you starting with the best wine and then getting involved in that and then finding it's not what you thought it was, how about that life then becomes that every day is better and every experience is greater? And every wonder is more wonderful. It's a reversal of the whole process of life is the message of this. It's a change that takes us beyond the trickery that this world tries to bring to us. And this world's full of tricks in that way. Serving you up something that draws you in and then giving you the rubbish after that. And then you don't know how to get out of it. You don't know how to escape. It's like, well, we're at the wedding and it would be rude to leave, wouldn't it? So it's true. I mean, how many of you have been at weddings where you thought, I hate this, but you don't leave? Right? There's one or two that are brave, and it's like, I'm going. I'm not staying here. But most of us aren't. Most of us, where we find ourselves, it may start okay, but then we don't, we don't leave. Even though now we hate it, even though now it's a problem, even though now it's lost its spark, we don't leave because we're that kind of people. Jesus is trying to break that cycle, Okay? But not by getting you to leave, but by changing the whole essence that makes up life. So then comes this very telling statement, which summarizes the whole heart and spirit of the gospel. Because uh, the master of the feast now says, heck, what, what is this? You know, most people bring out the good wine, and then when people are drunk, they bring out the rubbish wine. But he turns to the... the, 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 the the, the organizer of the feast, and he says, but you have saved the best till now. You have saved the best 
till now. now. Now, this is the telling statement that's at the very heart and is the spirit of the gospel, that you have saved the best till now. I, I heard this scripture misquoted more times than I can, I can tell you because it came from a distorted understanding of what the gospel was and inability to recognize some of the truths that we've talked about tonight. So I heard people talk about you saved the best to last. Well, when is last? When is last? That might be when you're gasping for your last. <laughs> when is last? But it's not. It's very, very particular wording that's used. You have saved the best till now. You've saved the best till now. When is now? When is now? Anybody got a problem in defining when is now? Can now be then? Can now be in the future? Is there only one time that now can be? Now can only be now. And when I said is there only one time that now could be, that's no longer now. So I can't say I said that now because I haven't just said that now because that was then. See, now is now. Now is this moment. Now is our existing, breathing, physical presence here. But here's the miracle of Jesus' first interaction with humanity. He changes the plan. He gets involved because of compassion. He lets us know that he's interested in unbreakable covenant towards us, that that's all that he is interested in and what he is about and establishing that with us. And as he steps into the process of this third day resurrection miracle, he says, because here's my desire that you will grasp right from the beginning of my ministry that I always save the best till now. So we have only two challenges. Number one, him guesting at our community, our life. And number two, accepting the now. You've saved the best till now. So it wasn't just somewhere in history that, 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 God in Jesus wanted to do a miracle for some obscure family in, in, in a little village called Cana, in a place called Galilee. It was the principle for all generations, for all time, for you and me right now, here tonight, the same story that this is the first and primary miracle of Jesus to come into our situations ordinary because we're not Cana, we're York. We're not in some... some, some uh, built house in, in, in Galilee, we're in, we're in the Rock Church building here in York. We're not them, we're us. But this same miracle comes through the ages to say, okay, there's an invited guest and this invited guest wants to take the ceremony and the ritual that we have made part of our lives that has not met the need that we have, has not given us what we are looking for and he wants to reassign all that process to something that frees us from ritual and ceremony and delivers life to us so the whole system is changed and the whole product is changed so that our whole nature is changed because he has saved the best till now. And the story finishes with this, in verse 11. This, the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee, he thus revealed his glory. So this first miracle was a revelation of his glory. Now, again, if you are out there with the ritual ceremony, you know, crazy ideas of, you know, this, well, just this outside thing that you can't get a handle on, the glory of God is not some shining light thing that's, you know, out somewhere in the whenever that when you see it is so intimidating. Actually, the glory of God really is just a revelation of who he is. That, that's, that's the shining of God. It's the shining of who he is. So this miracle was a revelation of his glory because it showed what he is all about. That's what I've tried to explain to you tonight. It simply showed what he was all about. His glory was revealed in the sense that it showed what he was all about. He was all about this involvement, this process, and this purpose. So, here's where we finish. Jesus calls us to feasting, not fasting. 
And I, I made a decision on this. You need to give up Lent for Easter. First of all, Lent is only something that was introduced about a thousand years ago. It's actually a reflection of a pagan ceremony. And the truth is, we are not sad about the next 40 days coming up to Jesus' death because we go beyond the 40 days to the resurrection because this miracle was done on the third day for a reason because everything was pointing to resurrection, life from the dead. Don't get stuck at the cross. Don't get stuck in the complexities of that. I want to bring you all the way through to where tombs are empty, lives are changed, water becomes wine. Ritual pots become the holders of life for you. Everything becomes transformed into something different. So if you want an advice, give up Lent for Easter. And you need to celebrate the invited guest. That's the deal tonight, to celebrate the invited guest. Celebrate the invited guest tonight. Celebrate the gift of righteousness that is yours. Celebrate the resurrection that is here now for you. Celebrate the water into wine. Because in your life, I believe that he has saved the best till now. And if you'll step into the now, understanding that this guest, present in your now, still changes the water into wine for everybody who let this guest step into their now. I believe whether that wine is for you a transformation of heart, mind, and spirit. You might be full of religious nonsense. You might be full of condemnation. and You might be trying through all kinds of ritual, whether your ritual is atheism or your ritual is a view of Christianity or whatever. You may be trying all those things to clean you, and all you'll finish up with is six empty pots and an empty heart. He's trying to set us free from all that. But if you come into the now with this invited guest now, I'll tell you what will happen. All those systems that you are trying to work will get transformed and God will work through and beyond those systems and adopt them so that they will accommodate what you think is just water, but as you begin to drink, it actually becomes wine, it becomes life, it becomes resurrection, and it works now. I believe the best is now, and we've got to start living the best now because we believe the best now, and so our confession is not, but how can that be because we're such unworthy sinners? Our question is, why should that not be? Because I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I have his gifted righteousness. I am in him, and because I am in him, all things are possible to me tonight. Jesus is here. He's at our wedding. He'll never leave it. Make him the invited guest, and you'll hear him speak the words over you. Drink this, and the best is now. Let's just bow our heads for one moment. Yeah, we thank you, Father. We thank you because, um, yeah, that we've had the wedding and the funeral. The one wedding that, that we need to be aware of because it's, it, it's you engaging covenant with us to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary, to break us out of our tombs, out of our death, out of our, out of our bondage, out of our failure, out of our disappointment, out of our disillusionment. And uh, the funeral is because we come to a resurrection. It's the death of the ritual pots. It's the death of all the purpose of ceremony. It's the death of all that. It's the funeral. We're saying goodbye to all that self-effort that we try to use to purify our lives. And we engage with and receive tonight, Father, the provision that you have made. We can't do better than bring water, but you bring wine. We can only bring the ordinary, you bring the extraordinary. We bring death with us, but you bring life with you. And so I believe right now, Father, in this place, you have saved the best until now. And so now, some of you need to step into the now. Some of you need to step into this moment and realize Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Some of you who don't know if you're on his mind, I can guarantee you, you're in his heart. You're more than on his mind, you're in his heart. And if you're wondering, why would he do this for me? My question is, why would he not do this for you? Well, I don't know what the plan is for my life. Well, the plan is, whatever the one who's the invited guest determines the plan should be when you're willing to come and just be honest and say, no more wine. 
and say to your whole life situation, whatever he says, you better do this. Because out of this confession is coming the third day resurrection life. There's coming the new wine into me. And this is the now, and he has saved the best till now. I want you to receive it. I want you to accept it. I want you to believe it. I want you to know it. It's a transformation, and you can receive it, participate in it with just an open heart tonight that recognizes the guest and recognizes the word and lets that create the new wine on the inside of you. So, Father, we bless you. We thank you. Help us to apply this and to live this and to know that now and then when, when I move on from here, now and now and now and when tomorrow is now and when the next day is now, my confession is, but you save the best till now. And you break the cycle of death within us and you bring to us the wonder of resurrection, third day life. We receive it tonight, Father. I bless every heart and every spirit and every soul in all of our struggles to know that in your love, you've saved for each one of us the best till now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, that's it. Have fun. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.